Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Get Wealthy show and podcast. Um, I am your host, Adrian Nolan Smith, and I am thrilled to have Donna Jackson Nakazawa, a science writer exploring the intersection of neurobiology and emotion, and the author of seven books, including a new book called Girls on the Brink. Donna, welcome. Thank you for being here. I'm sure to be here with you. Okay, so um, I asked Donna to come on the show with me because um, I have been fascinated by the concept of neuroimmunology, which she's going to talk more about, and just really the ways in which the immune system and our brains and emotions and mental health and brain science all kind of affect one another. And um, she's going to tell us a lot more about that. So first of all, can you introduce the concept of neurobiology and also neuroimmunology, since it's, I think, a little bit different to the Wellbeing community and how your work ended up focusing on this very specific but fascinating topic? Really, uh, what's of interest to me as a science writer is exploring and, and finding a way to take what's really happening in scientists' labs and shorten that time span between what they know and what we know, right? We're, you know, in our lived experience, how can we more quickly assimilate what's coming out of the top labs and the top researchers around the world so that we can live healthier lives? And certainly, um, over the past 10 to 15 years, the world of neurobiology has just expanded exponentially with an understanding of how these things are connected. Our thoughts, our stress response, our immune system kicking in for good or for ill, and how that in turn affects our physical and mental health. So the word for that, the fancy word is psychoneuroimmunology. And if you break it down, it makes sense. Psych, our thoughts, neuro, brain activity, immunology, your immune system, what we could also think of of, of our stress response, like how, how, how much are we like getting ready to fight our environment? And so all those things are connected. And the last decade has just been mind blowing in terms of our understanding of how the body and the brain are talking to each other, what they're chatting about and how that affects our health. So I'm a science journalist is my um, agent and editor like to say, you like a gnarly problem. And um, I do like to explain gnarly problems. And I think that's probably why I do focus on neurobiology and emotion the way that I do, because if you can explain it to people in the right way, with the right stories, the right images, and with the right depth, it changes their ability to do the work, to be better able to respond to the nonstop stressors that are especially coming at us in today's world. I really agree with that. I'm a patient advocate apart from this content side of my work. And you have such a different experience with human beings when you explain the why. Like once they get the concept of something, they'll want to do it more than just being told to do it and not understanding why they're doing it. I think it's really empowering um, and important and really the key to any sort of behavior change, I think. But as I said, you know, not only uh, do I do that, but well be on the content side, I've been highlighting experts like yourself, but also successful healing journeys um, through a more holistic approach. And I think you've had one yourself. So could you share a little bit about your autoimmune disorder and how your healing journey led you to your work, but also to um, the discovery of adverse childhood experiences, also known as the acronym ACEs, and this link between difficult childhood experiences and chronic illness in adulthood? So it's weird because I've been a journalist for so long. And so it's really weird how sometimes my personal experience will dovetail with something that I'm reporting. So for instance, case and study, I wrote a book called The Autoimmune Epidemic, which some of your listeners might know. It came out quite a, quite a, maybe 15 years ago. 
And while I was writing that book, I knew that I already had thyroiditis, which is an autoimmune disease. And I had small fiber sensory neuropathy, which is a neurological autoimmune disease. But as I was writing it, I also developed a very rare autoimmune disease similar to MS, but um, a little bit different in, in, in its trajectory and recovery called Guillain-Barre syndrome. And during that time, I was actually writing the book about autoimmune disease. And I thought, okay, I really have to double down here because for me, that experience, even as I recovered, I then had a relapse. And while I was raising really young children, I was disappearing into the hospital for four or five weeks at a time. And anyone with autoimmune disease who knows that how unexpectedly things can flare and completely erase life as you know it, so to speak, and land you in the hospital for long periods of time. I really felt, especially uh, writing from a feminist perspective with the growing knowledge at that time that these diseases affected primarily women and that there were differences in how the immune system was responding to stress and particularly differences in how female autoimmune disease pa patients with autoimmune disease, how seriously they were being taken by their physicians, right? Like the gaslighting that was going on around autoimmune disease a little more than a decade ago would totally floor a listener listening today. So we still know gaslighting, medical gaslighting is like all the rage, but at that time, it, the average woman that I was interviewing with autoimmune disease had been written off by so many doctors that her fight to find answers and to find validation and healing in the medical community was enraging to witness as I interviewed people. And I was very lucky at that time to, I have a neurologist who I absolutely adore at Hopkins, we're very close, and I was getting good treatment. But even with good treatment, people around me treated me like, well, what do you mean, you know, you're, you were paralyzed, you know, like, well, how did that happen? I even had one guy say to me, um, a very famous researcher, say to me, well, nobody gets Guillain-Barre twice. That couldn't have happened. Maybe something else is going on. And of course, you know, you talk to any neurologist and they will tell you there are patients who do have the disease a second time. So that left me really at a disadvantage raising my beautiful son and daughter. I spent six months in a wheelchair the second time I had Guillain-Barre. And it changed their lives dramatically. And they would witness me like just trying to get it. You know, I couldn't go up and down steps for a very long time. And even when, when I could again, the exhaustion level would be like, get up to sit down for half an hour, get up to sit down for half an hour. And I just didn't want that life for us or for them. Uh, my own father had died when I was 12. And I just wanted to find out everything that I could after I'd written the autoimmune epidemic, and I went on this year-long journey to try to figure out everything I could about psychoneuroimmunology to bring down my own stress response and kind of shift my brain out of that um, sympathetic nervous system, fight, flight, freeze, and into a different aspect of that autonomic nervous system, which I'm sure your audience is well aware of, out of fight, flight, freeze, back into that rest, I just savoring sensation to be the parent and the human and live the life that I felt that was there if I could figure out a way to do it. And in that process, to answer your question, I came across ACES study and it had already been out for a while, but nobody was reporting on it. And I just couldn't wrap my head around again, how such a major trend was not known to the average person. So I reported that book uh, the Last Best Cure in 2010. And it was just unheard of. Nobody knew what we were talking about when we talked about ACEs. But as your listeners know, and I'm sure you're aware, we've since discovered 
Uh, 2,000 more studies have been done since then based on the original study, which came out in 1998. And 2,000 studies show that there is a dose-dependent relationship between the number of categories of adversity that you face before the age of 18 and your later mental and physical health. And that takes us back to your first question, which is how is it that your fight flight response, your stress response jacks up your immune system in ways that predict disease across the lifespan? Wow. So, okay. So now that we know, you know, from all these studies confirming it, um, that there's this connection, did you have, I mean, you don't have to detail them, but did you have ACEs that you could then relate to your own uh, autoimmune disorder or was that sure. unrelated? Yeah. No, I, I think that we generally find, and we know that for women in particular, for every category of adverse childhood experiences or ACEs you experience growing up, your chance of later being hospitalized with an autoimmune disease. So that's pretty serious. You don't just have an autoimmune disease. You are hospitalized with it is rises by 20% for every category of adversity. So that work is done by Delisa Fairweather, who was at Hopkins, who's now at Mayo, and also Vincent Politi, the original uh, founder of the ACE research. So that relationship, when I saw the, this research again, I was like, okay, why aren't we talking about this? And why aren't we doing something about it? Uh, for me, yes. Uh, my father died from a medical accident when I was very young, it changed family life dramatically for all of us. So my ACEs were pretty high. But I also felt that that, to go back to something we said earlier, that that information was gold, right? Like, okay, if I know, and if the research shows that our stress response, like how much of a state of emergency are we in all the time? Like how much are we revving up like a background hum across our lives? You know, that background hum that's going. If that's really determined by our experiences early in life, if that stress machinery gets activated and it kind of stays on so that uh, the way I explain it, it's kind of like a garden hose, Right. The stress response should turn on and off like a faucet. It's on when it's appropriate, turns off when you no longer need it. But in people with ACEs, um, adverse childhood experiences, particularly three or more, that stress response in childhood gets turned on like a garden hose. And the genes that oversee how it turns on and off shift, epigenetic shifts happen so that that stress response stays geared on high because as a child, that's what you needed. You needed to keep in that state of chronic vigilance. And over time, it shifts the genes that oversee your stress response, setting it on high across the lifespan. So it makes sense that we see more disease, more mental health issues, in relationship to ACEs, my question was, how do I turn the garden hose off? What are some ways I could do that? Um, and let me do them. Yeah. You mentioned the number three because, or I'm, I'm asking another question about that because I took it online myself. I had some ACEs growing up too. And I also have a mild uh, case of Hashimoto's that I've had for as long as I can remember. And I read about this far before I ever, you know, read about your work. And I think people can take this uh, test free oh, sure. online. Yeah, yeah. I think it was like, what, maybe 15 questions, something like that. 10 questions. 10 Although questions. it's since expanded to include many other types of childhood stressors because the original 10 questions really talk about household dysfunction and things going on within the home. But we now have a very clear understanding that ACEs also include stressors in the community, like poverty and racism, sexism, uh, community violence, and so on. Um, those are also things that create chronic unpredictable stress in a child's life, which sets that garden hose on high. But anyway, you were telling your story. No, no. 
Um, I'm glad to hear that because I did take it quite a, a long time ago. So I think it, it's good to know it's been updated. But yes, I remember that I I had two. And so I was like, oh, I'm right below the, <laughs> the limit. But certainly I, I can't help but think that they are, you know, the two things are connected. My, you know, my own health. And like you, I sort of uh, learned enough to know that it's not a life sentence, that there's a no. very that there are very different ways that you can um, reverse and or even manage or bring down your body's uh, level of autoimmunity should you have one or more autoimmune conditions um, that you can have it be almost subclinical even um, or completely gone or be something that makes you completely disabled and takes over your life. So it's very different. And a lot of that work is you know, diet and lifestyle related, but also this work that we're going to talk about later that, that you've come up with, um, that is more so around the mental, emotional side of it. So before we do, I wanted to ask you, you know, are there types of adversity that children face that you found to be most detrimental when it comes to predisposing children to autoimmune diseases specifically, but just adult disease? Because I know now that there's many in the community and in the home, but were there any found in these studies that were even more specific or just the ones that are generally on the ACE exam? So you would be probably surprised by this. Um, the earliest researchers found a correlation that was slightly more significant in terms of later developing, um, not autoimmune disease specifically, but uh, adult physical health problems. And later came a study out of the University of Texas at Austin, which looked at, was there any type of early adversity specifically more related to the likelihood of developing mental health disorders? So physical and mental health. These studies took place 15 years apart, but they both came up with the following answer, which is that the type of childhood adversity most likely to predict that higher state of vigilance and therefore mental and physical health issues in adulthood is being chronically put down, humiliated, or criticized by your parents or caregivers. Wow. Wow. That's so incredible. Because I think many people, before you just said that, who didn't have a traumatic uh, childhood by maybe the media's definition, like gunshots and death and um, divorce or being physically abused or sexually abused or something like that are thinking, okay, this is an interesting topic, but like, I'm not, you know, it's not right. something that I went through, but many people have had uh, that kind of relationship with one or both, usually just one parent who, you know, really puts them down um, in a way that's not even apparent sometimes until you leave the home to see that you were uh, being categorically kind of um, put down in a way where your self-esteem is not, you know, what it should be and, and, and all that. So very, very interesting. Very uh, interesting. Also a uh, strong correlation with emotional neglect, feeling that your family doesn't have your back. So those two go together, right? Like if you yeah. grow up kind of being thrown under the bus or belittled or humiliated by a parent or told whatever you're stupid or you'll never amount to anything or just made fun of, you know, in those microaggressive ways, then and emotional neglect is feeling like, okay, if I tell somebody I broke my toe, they might not take me to the doctor or, you know, maybe I need new clothes, but nobody really cares enough about me to do that. And then of course, sexual abuse is also highly um, correlated to later mental and physical health problems. But really the one that researchers keep coming back to is this idea of being really betrayed by a caregiver with these small moments of humiliations, ridicule, put downs. Um, and so that really gives us attention as parents, right? Like, whoa, this is a big piece of information. Yeah, that's so fascinating. And if you think about it, sexual abuse in childhood is really, I mean, your parental role is to protect. And right. so even if the abuse came from somebody that your parents didn't know, or they had nothing to do with it happening, you still in a way would feel betrayed 
by your parents yes. for protecting you. So it comes back to the same idea, I, I think, of, you know, not feeling protected by the people who are supposed to protect you um, at this very vulnerable point in life where you can't really protect yourself, childhood. So that is so interesting. Can you explain the science be behind how traumatic events can change the architecture of a child's brain? You just mentioned um, the expression of genes actually changing that control stress hormone output uh, because of these traumatic events, which then does something. So can you talk a little bit about that? I believe it has sure, to be- Sure, sure, sure. So one of, one of my books, uh, which came out in 2020, it's called The Angel and the Assassin. And it's really about- Great, great name for a book, no matter what the topic. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> well, then I've said enough. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> So the angel and the assassin was really um, the two years that I spent reporting on this very new, so new, an area in neuroscience, which uh, it was only in 2011 that researchers discovered. And by the way, it was two kick butt female neuroscientists at Harvard, by the way, discovered that in the brain, not only do we have a functioning immune system which is the sister to the immune system that functions in the body, that little immune cells called microglia, which researchers had largely overlooked for a hundred years and thought these little microglial cells were just like these boring housekeeper cells that carted away dead neurons. And they started a series of experiments under the hunch that, well, maybe they were doing more than that. And it turns out that these little microglial cells are white blood cells that during gestation on about the seventh or eighth day of gestation, they break off in utero, right? As an embryo is developing in utero, they break off from our white blood cells, they rise to the brain and there, there are the resident immune cells in the brain that oversee, get this, how healthy your synaptic neural connections will be for life. And just like your immune system, so let's think about your immune system in your body, your immune system is dancing with your environment 24-7, right? That's its job. It's like, are you safe? You're not safe. I've got to react to this. Oh my God, you stubbed your toe. Got to go there. Oh my God, you breathed in you know, um, something while you were gardening and spraying the roses. Got to go there and defend you from that. You know, Obviously, things like COVID, whatever it might be, you hit your finger, uh, what were your thumb while you're hanging a picture? Got to go there and take care of that thumb. Well, it turns out that our body, as we said earlier, is also responding to social and emotional threats. Take the adverse childhood experiences. Your body is becoming more vigilant. Your body is going to prepare for the possibility of harm when you are emotionally stressed. Because across evolutionary time, and I'm getting a little deep in the weeds here, but I promise I'll close the loop. For us as humans, getting along together required a lot of col collaboration and cooperation, right? So to be clear, I just talked about like physical harms that would make your immune system rev up. Now I'm talking about social harm that would also make your immune system rev up. The reason your immune system starts to rev up in the face of social threats is because across evolutionary time, if you were not in social harmony as part of your tribe, you would be sort of set to the outside of the tribe. You would be the last person to get the meat or the fresh tubers or the fruit. You would be the first person to get picked off by marauding tribes or predators. So would your children. There goes your gene pool. Right. If you're fully ostracized, guess what? It's over. There's starvation, predators, marauding tribes. You're definitely going to be wounded at some point. So your children. So our immune systems are so wicked smart. That well, and I would imagine nobody else in the tribe then wants to mate with you. So there goes your oh, cool right. too. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, you are. And at that very first sign, like somebody rolling their eyes, dissing you over the fire, your immune system would rev up and prepare for physical danger because that's where that led. That is where that train was going. They had no trains back then. Um, but that's where the train was going. Social emotional threats cause our immune system to rev up as if 
it is physical harm. And we have such good evidence of this in terms of measuring people's immune response through biomarkers like CRP or IL-6 or a whole host of them when stressors arise. And we could see our immune system goes, boom, I'm ready. I'm ready for that, that hit over the head. I'm ready for that whatever physical danger. So to our bodies, social emotional threats actually have a higher, more long lasting expense to our immune systems than do physical threats. I know it's hard to wrap your head around. And, and so what you were asking me is how is that tied to our mental health? And I talked about microglia. Now I'll tie them all together, like I promised. So when our body and our brain, which we're talking all the time, guess what? Those immune cells in your body, the white blood cells, those macrophages, which oversee them, T cells and the microglia in your brain, they're all chatting. We thought that they didn't talk, right? We thought mind body were somehow separate, but they're talking all the time. And they're talking about one thing. Are you safe or are you not safe? When that answer is not safe, whether it is physical harm or emotional threats, those microglial cells clock threat and they can begin to morph. And I've watched them on researchers' screens in the lab. They morph from these lovely little angel dancers that run around the brain and they pour like growth nutrient into neuronal connections and they run around like good doctors do going, are you okay over here? Like, how can we help this neural connection make it? They morph from those elegant dancers to become these big, like hairy Pac-Man like cells and you can watch them do it. And they go, oh man, Time to change from the angel to the assassin. Got a threat coming in. And they make the same mistakes that are made in the body in response to unrelenting stress. Whereas in the body, we can see the body begin to turn on itself in autoimmune disease, right? As an overreaction to incoming stressors. In the brain, what that looks like is these elegant, beautiful microglial cells become big, fat, hairy Pac-Man-like cells, and they over-respond and they start eating up neural synapses. And later we can see this on brain scans. It looks like depression, anxiety, cognitive decline, Alzheimer's disease. And by the way, we're seeing this writ large when people talk about the neurobiological aspects of COVID. Guess what cell is responsible? Microglial cells. So how is it all related? It turns out it's science. That's incredible. A topic that is uh, very, very high on the interest list of the well being community and has been since I started this back in mid 2017 is gut health and the gut microbiome. And so I know from past research I've read that about 70% of our immune cells are in the lining of our gut. Yeah, And um, I was thinking about at that as you were talking about our immune cells and how they're always communicating with the our brains and the rest of our body. And I wondered if you could just connect those dots for me, the traumatic event with the gut and sure. you know, the so immune response. If you think of our immune system as like, I don't like to use war metaphors, but it is easy for people to think of them as all these little armies like stationed to different countries, but those countries are all in a treaty and they all work together to for basic harmony. You could think of, you've got like one army in the brain, one army in the gut, another army in the heart, like our heart has this huge immune, immune response. Um, and then another army like populated all over your body. Think of it like a board game. They're all talking, they're sending, they have sentinels, they're sending like people on reconnaissance all the time <laughs> from the gut to the brain. And this is why we're starting to see, and I've done a lot of reporting on how shifts in diet can kind of reboot from working with the gut actually can help reboot and cleanse out the microglia in the brain. So 
it's all connected. You know that if you're listening, you know that, or you wouldn't be listening to this great podcast with Adrian. And you, it's it's why you're here, and it's real. Yeah, that's incredible. Um, the vagus nerve, I believe, right, is the connection between the brain and the and the gut. And um, I feel like I can't stress to people enough, but it's still hard to understand. Most people understand the one direction, you know, the the brain sending the gut messages um, because they've had that nervous stomach before they give a speech, right? Um, or even like a distended stomach during time of great nervousness. Um, but it's all it's very hard to get people to understand the other direction of of like these bad microbes in the gut going up and you know causing bad moods and poor mental health and you know, an out of whack stress response. Um, and then throw on top of that, how, how someone would have fight disease. And they're like, Whoa, you know, it's almost too much. It's a lot. And I think a way to simplify it is just that if the country of your gut is having a problem, your brain, it's cut the cousins in your brain, that immune response in your brain will be affected. So again, these are like different countries working together for overall NATO health. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Got it. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about your latest book because it's uh, tied together everything that you've already told us about, but in a specific population, which is adolescent girls, um, called girls on the brink. And, um, can you explain what motivated you to write this book? And of course, what, what were your findings about the neuroimmunology of this group specifically? Sure. So, um, obviously I I do like a gnarly problem. If you've been listening to this podcast for this long, then you know that. And I keep what I call back burner files, like things that are interesting me as I'm reading the research, reading medical journals, kind of looking at trends in neurobiology, or I'm out there like talking to neuroscientists I know and staying in touch with what's happening. And about 10 years ago, I was already starting to be very disturbed by the rising rates of depression and anxiety in girls. Then around 2019, before the pandemic, a big study came out, which flew under the radar. And it showed that one in three adolescent girls today in the United States were reporting periods of major depressive disorder. We're not talking about like upset over a breakup, but They were six weeks or more of a period of time of hopelessness, worthlessness, guilt, shame, and not wanting to partake in their regular activities. And it was so different from what we were seeing 10 years before. So uh, this file really grew until um, after I finished my book tour for The Angel and the Assassin, I told my editor and my agent, "I I have to dig into this. And they were super supportive. And then, of course, the numbers just kept getting worse. And it, if you read newspapers, you know that the CDC came out with their biannual report just four weeks ago and showed that now that number is 57% of girls reporting periods of major depression. And the CDC report is really, really mind-blowing. And the mental health arm of the CDC came out and said American girls are engulfed in trauma and worthlessness and hopelessness. So um, I didn't know they were working on that report while I was writing my book, but certainly it backs up what I was seeing as I went around the country and followed girls for two years and interviewed them and talked to the leading neurobiologists. And again, because I write from a feminist perspective, I just want to be clear about that because women have been so undermined by science and ignored by it at the same time. I did a little more digging. And now that you've heard my bailiwick as a, as a researcher and writer, imagine my surprise when I found that all of the research that I'd been reporting on across my career was based on a male research model. So I also have a heart issue. Um, I had a pacemaker for about 40 years having to do with my autoimmune stuff. And all of the work done in heart, in heart disease 
had been done on men until the early 2000s, right? When the NIH went, hmm, women are dying in droves from heart disease, but it looks different from what it looks like in the men we studied. Go figure, we didn't study any women, maybe we ought to do that. Everything that we talked about, about stress and adversity across health and development into adolescence, how it shifts genes, sets the stage for the stress response and mental health across adulthood had been done on male research models, okay? So that just pissed me off. <laughs> and meanwhile, I am raising a son and a daughter and I was seeing in my daughter's cohort that things were different than they were for boys of the same ages. So I spent a lot of time with, again, amazing kick butt female neuroscientists who were themselves kicking this, kicking over our assumptions that the female brain would respond to unrelenting stress in the same way as the male brain. And what they found was really amazing. So to step back for a minute, we've long known that girls at puberty, for reasons unknown, have a two to three times higher rate of depression and anxiety than boys. But we haven't really known why. And part of the reason for this obviously has to do with sexism and misogyny. As girls get older, they're going into a world that's inherently more stressful because of the way that women have always been undervalued. We don't need a scientist to tell us that, right? If you're female, if you're listening right now, you can look around in your private life, you can look in your work life, and you can see plenty of examples for yourself of how you've been treated differently or maybe been more susceptible to everything from uh, date rape to um, sexual harassment at work to not being paid the same wage. Every woman's experience is different, but I know if I get a group of women together at a dinner table, we all have our stories. Let's just leave it at that. So part of it's that, right? That's not rocket science, but part of it is something else that when we talk about these unrelenting stressors in children's lives, girls face more of them. They have higher scores of ACEs probably having to do with being more vulnerable in society's eyes growing up with being smaller and uh, less able to quote unquote fight back or whatever it is and being diminished in a misogynistic culture. But something else is going on as well. And that brings us back to the neurobiology. And that is that as estrogen comes in, it is a stress amplifier. Now, estrogen is not the problem. It's a wonderful superpower hormone. Anybody who's ever been around an adolescent girl or knows one knows that the adolescent female brain is an absolute freaking superpower. Like that spidey sense is unparalleled. That corpus callosum, which co connects the left and right sides of the brain is bigger, richer. Girls just see everything, you know? And estrogen is also a superpower in the way that it's the reason why women can stay awake as long as a man, sometimes longer, run as fast, but do it all with smaller organs in a smaller body while making room for a uterus and carrying another life. How is it that we can do all of that? Estrogen is a boost in a way that testosterone is not. It's, you know, I use the example of like Ginger Rogers doing everything that Fred Astaire did, but backwards and in high heels, right? That's just we have this ability to do more on less and carry another life as humans. But estrogen can flip from this evolutionary advantage to an evolutionary disadvantage. So it amps up this response, immune response. It's also the reason that um, women have a more robust response to vaccines, right, than men do. Jacked up immune response, yay for us. But when stressors in the environment are unrelenting, when they don't stop, when we don't have a good locus of control over the stressors in our lives, whether they are physical or emotional, estrogen can flip from an evolutionary advantage to an evolutionary disadvantage. And at no time is this more true than at puberty, where it jacks up the stress response, turning that hose on that we talked about earlier, right? in a way that sets 
that stage for that chronic overactivation of the stress response. So when that happens and puberty is now happening several years earlier than it used to, that surge that is coming in that is normally protective because estrogen is so much more than a uh, sex hormone, like we associate it with that thrum of sexual excitement. It's a master regulator in the brain. It regulates the body. It regulates the organs. And at puberty, the brain, male, female, anywhere on the gender spectrum, is a detective machine. It is taking into account every stressor you have ever faced up until that moment and including at that time. And it is going to remodel the brain based on that information. And if the environment, and bring in social media and the world we've created that kids are living in today, if that environment is sending you stress messages 24 seven, whether on your phone, on your screen, in the world you live in, school competition, competition on the sports field, whatever it is, that brain is going to remodel based on the idea that the world is inherently super, super, super stressful. You are going to grow up and go out into that world as a girl. You are going to grow up. You're going to have children maybe one day, and your body is now going to gear up for a world in which you go to fight and be prepared for really bad things. And we don't want that. We don't want that because that brain is a brain that's also geared up for anxiety and depression. So if you want to simplify this, because that is so deep in the weeds, but there you go. If you want to simplify it, you could think of it this way, that Kids are going through puberty earlier than they should. Stressors have increased, jacking up their stress machinery. For girls, estrogen comes piling in, which jacks up the stress machinery even more. The brain is getting remodeled, refired, newly wired, based on the idea that the world is inherently stressful, traumatic, and overwhelming before before girls have had a chance to go through the experiences of adolescence to wire and fire up the brain in healthy ways. So this is what researchers call an evolutionary mismatch between the world we've created, especially for girls, and social media, of course, plays a role, and across evolutionary time, this idea that childhood develops, we have our kid, the kids' backs, they have this free period of time to develop, figure out how to respond to social stressors. Oh, does that friend like me or not like me? I'll figure it out. You know, is a problem something so stressful that it's the end of the world or is a problem something that will get better with time? How do I ask for help? How do I even articulate the feelings that I'm having that are confusing? When puberty comes in early and the world is highly stressful, the brain hasn't wired and fired up yet for resilience, and it's being reshaped and remodeled by the wrong things at the wrong time. So, well, that was all incredibly interesting. Um, and something you just said made me think of a topic, which is also very interesting and talked about a lot at Wellbe besides gut health, and that is um, environmental health and toxicity in our environment. And I've had experts on and shared a lot about um, how plastics and these other hormone disrupting chemicals can often come into a woman's body or to any, you know, male or female, and be what they call, you know, xenoestrogens or they're fake estrogens, and your body interprets it as the hormone estrogen. Meanwhile, it's not at all. It's a chemical that's in a plastic water bottle or whatever it is. Um, and how too much estrogen can then cause, you know, so much hormonal imbalance with these other hormones. And you're seeing so many of these diseases in young women, the PCOS, the, you know, estrogen dominance, um, all of that. So when you were saying we're going through puberty before we should, I've learned that a lot of that has to do with these xenoestrogens and drinking um, 
you know, uh, milk from factory farm cows at a young age and just having too much hormone in your body that's unhealthy, um, creating a younger age for going through puberty. I believe that's kind of some of the re- some of the reasons I've heard. So it's not just a normal amount. It's now, you know, the stressors of our environment are yes, social media and this digital world that at any moment, a horrible email, text or direct message on Instagram could come in or a picture of all of your friends at a birthday party that you, everybody's in the picture and you are not there instant, you know, your whole body, your, your physical response, you would feel it, right? It's just like, you know, shock. And all of that is over here, what you were talking about. But then like, in addition, you're dealing with all these chemical toxicities creating hormonal imbalance. So it is just a perfect storm of terribleness for adolescent girls. So let me just pile on there for a second and say that, um, yes, estrogen disruptors have reported a lot about them, but there's also something else that we haven't really taken into account that may be even more powerful and powerful in unfortunately a negative way is that we're having, we have pretty good research, um, that shifts in diet are also very, very related to early puberty. We can't leave that out. But, um, in addition, we have good research that the higher the degree of early stress in kids' lives, the quicker the body wants to go through puberty to, again, prepare to defend, right? Like if I grow up faster, I can defend myself better in this crazy effed up world that somehow is like coming at me hot, fast, and constantly. So um, interesting. Yeah, it's worrisome. It's all very worrisome. But the good news is that, again, when we understand the science, it gets us very motivated to do things a little bit differently. And I think our girls deserve that. Definitely. Um, So that was my next question for you. Um, You know, what can parents, society, schools uh, do to support the adolescent female brain and hormone balance and the immune response? Um, during this critical development period? And inversely, what should they not do? Sure. So I think that um, obviously we don't have time. My book, Girls on the Brink, has 15 like super well-researched antidotes that took me two years to put together and write. So I'm going to try to run through some of them, but I won't be able to do all of it. It's hard yes, yes. So on. people who are interested in this topic um, should absolutely get Donna's book to go further. Well, like, get the book or <laughs> borrow it from a friend or get it from the library or listen to it on Audible. I'm not, I'm not one to be hawking my books, but I will say that, um, that, you know, the parent groups we have going, it, it, it can be very empowering to have a guide on your bedstand, right? Like something to dig into and go through these strategies. I see parents with them underlined and flagged and Some have like made posters for their insides of their kitchen cabinets to remind them of things in those hot kitchen moments. But anyway, um, so I think the really way to tie it all together is that we want to remember that all of these unwanted changes happen when stress is unrelenting and that the more psychological stressors rise in girls' lives as they have. Um, When we talk about misogyny, it's like been dialed up all the way by social media. It's just unbelievable. It's always been there, but now it's just like, whoa, what girls tell me they see on social media, you know, uh, to be popular at school, they have to be hot on social media to be hot in social media. They have to be like an adult sexualized female at a very early age. And then if they are, then they might not be popular or liked or have friends because they're, um, you know, seen as like being too sexual. And they also have to worry about being stalked by like older creepy men who reach out to them. So like, there's no moment girls tell me in their lives where they can find a footing where they feel like they can find that space and place for them where their identity can be developed with self-agency. It's always a response to what the environment around them is asking for. So if all of those stressors are rising, and heck, we've named a lot of them, we didn't even get to school shootings and climate change and this crazy political stupid discourse and whatever you want to say about that. 
all those stressors are rising, we've got to bring down their stress machinery. That's the bottom line. So how can we do that? Well, the number one factor is, of course, and it goes back to the beginning of our conversation, is really strong connection and parent-child attunement. And kids who grow up with parents who can answer yes to one question are 12 times more likely to thrive. And that one question is, how well can you and your child talk about anything? Can they come to you to tell you about anything? And what would prevent a child from being able to do that? Well, we've got to look at ourselves. We've got to look at how we manage our own stress, how we manage our own trauma, how we manage our own stuff, so that in those moments, which are high stakes, high octane parenting moments, we are able to regulate ourselves in record time. It's work. I have a whole two and a half hour online program to help parents do this. We have to develop the skills. If you love your child, you must develop the skills to manage your own stress, your own trauma, your own history, so that you can be regulated because every single thing that is happening in your body will be mirrored in your child's body and brain. If they're going to come to you with hard things, they have to know that you are that safe, attuned, listening parent who can hear them for as long as it takes without your own emotional reactivity getting in the way. And there are really clear steps to help you do that, but it is the single most important thing that we can do. And it's not throw a flame or a blame on parents. We all grew up with our stuff. You and I have admitted here, we have our own adverse childhood experiences. And we know that individuals with a history of adversity and stress have more trouble regulating as parents in family life. We just know that. Um, and we know that when we go in and teach parents some of these skills to understand their own trauma, see the connections in family life or what makes me really, what are those white hot moments for me? And when we get it, when we go, oh my God, this is, this is happening. This is a white hot moment for me, but it's not about me. Here's how I regulate myself. And here's how I become that attuned parent who is absolutely cellularly safe for a child to turn to no matter what is happening. That is the relationship goal that we're looking for. And it is work. The work starts with you. You can't get around it. That's how it is. But it's the biggest gift you will ever give your child. And from there, you can move on to the other 15, 14 antidotes. <laughs> as soon as you said the question, can they come to you with yeah. uh, anything? I immediately started thinking about, you know, my own parents, my husband's parents, my friend's parents, my, and how so much of what my, you know, myself, my husband, my friends felt they could or could not go to their parents with had to do with their parents' own trauma yep. and how they were raised. And, you know, even if they didn't love it, but they had a father who was very like, we talk like men, we don't talk about, you know, sissy things, then they, one part of their brain knew that they didn't like that and that it wasn't a great way to grow up. The other part of the brain sort of overrides it. And then they find themselves more or less having the same, like, but we're still going to be manly men with their son. <laughs> and the Excellent. son's like, but didn't you just tell me you hated that about your dad? Uh -huh. And yet you can't help but do this with me, you know? And so you just also realize how much of this is conditioning and what a great lift it is and, and a very hard lift it is hard to lift. undo this. But it is doable. And I taught this program again, I'm not hawking this, you know, whatever you want to do with, you, you know, um, if it's helpful, yay. If not, there are so many helpful things out there. But I've taught this three-hour program at universities across the country, from medical schools to behavioral health teams, from you know Rutgers to Columbia to um, whatever. And it's just we have the ability now to use narrative writing prompts, some drawing. I teach some drawing, you know, because it's and to actually. Use discrete, fast exercises 
to help you get that trauma out and onto the page in very simple ways. Let me tell you, this is very simple. And to create a fact pattern out of it that while learning how to have self-compassion for that and for what happened, right? Because it isn't just about what happened. It's about turning the way, flipping the way that you see it with self-compassion. And when you understand those connections, when you understand that fact pattern, it changes everything because you can be in the moment with your family. You can be in the moment with your child and you go, there it is. There's my vortex. I got it. And I know how to view it with a self-compassion that is shifting inside of me because I'm developing the tools to do that. And when I do that, I can flip my story to make meaning out of it and be that person for this young person who I love more than anything on the planet. And it's not as heavy a lift. Most people find it so liberating. It's like the answers of a lifetime are there and available. It's, I feel like I'm being salesy or something. I don't mean to be sounding that way. It's just so beautiful to watch people go through this process. And it's a heavy lift, but we have ways to make it, make the connections, connect the dots more quickly and more easily with self-compassion, with self-love than I think people realize. And we have really great research that narrative writing programs really reduce stress and anxiety for parents and Anyway, I think it's an underutilized tool. I, I report on and teach a lot of different tools for bringing down our stress response. But I guess as a writer, I'm biased. What can I say? I think narrative writing is vastly underutilized, especially given that during the pandemic, the research on it was really grew. And we understand that it brings down our own neurobiological uh, easily measurable biomarkers for stress and inflammation. I read about your um, narrative writing program and I did want to ask, maybe this is a stupid question, but how is narrative writing different from just journal writing? Oh, sure. So narrative writing uses specific science-based, these are neuroscience-based prompts that are designed to help you get past your own resistance to answer your questions about yourself, right? Got it. So okay. It helps you take that leap. Like if you're sitting down to journal by yourself, where do you start? Like, what are you asking yourself? You might be really hard on yourself. You might think, well, so what? I'm writing about what dad said when I was 10 or mom did when I was 14. Well, where do I take it? Well, what does that mean? Well, how do I even begin to break it down into small, discernible, understandable bits so that I can use it for self-revelation, for self-discovery, for understanding, rewriting, not just my story, but my neural responses to stress. So yeah. we put together all of these different neuroscience-based tools to both do a deep dive in a safe way to get the answers that are elusive, create a fact pattern around them that's emotionally felt while creating safety in that exploration. And then being able to take that information and use it to shift how you respond in the moment right now. Yeah, that's that seems <laughs> an extremely good process for, <laughs> for what you need to do. And I wanna make sure since a lot of people listen to this who may not be parents or may be thinking more about the chronic illness connection that the, the narrative writing programs that you've developed that you're talking about are for both. It's not just well, about- for anyone. I have plenty parenting. of people who don't do it for parenting. It's just, we ended up talking about my latest book. So I sort of naturally connected them for that reason. But no, of course, whether, look, we are doing this for us. And sure, if your motivation is your child, that's great. But I actually think it's better if your motivation is yourself. And yeah, it's amazing how many people change something in their lives that would greatly increase their happiness and reduce their suffering if they would have done it years ago, but they don't do it until their, their parents. And they say they're doing it for their children. And I even 
you know, became a mother in 2021. And when I got pregnant, I had been reading about different trauma release type therapies and knew I had some and mostly related to my, you know, parents, of course, as I would think almost all childhood traumas are. Um, and decided to start doing EMDR therapy right. when I was pregnant. I did it throughout my fir- first pregnancy, but you know, how long would it have taken me to, to do it if I hadn't gotten pregnant? Like it was the catalyst. Cause I knew I had a deadline and I was like, yeah, all right, sure. let's get these weekly sessions in, yeah, right. you know, um, get this right. trauma out before, uh, you know, uh, he's here. So, um, of course you don't get it all out at all. Um, but it's uh, a journey. Think, it's a lifelong it's, journey. It's, it's a, a journey. journey. Yeah, definitely. Well, we have, you know, spent, um, <laughs> more time than I thought we would together. And I am so, uh, deeply grateful for you sharing your work and for the work that you do. Um, I think there are so many people struggling to understand the connection between why they have illness to begin with, but specifically autoimmune, because it feels so, it feels like such betrayal, right? Your own body is uh, attacking itself. Like, why would it do that? It's so wrong, you know, and whether it leads to infertility and miscarriage and, um, or just disability or, you know, just suffering and these skin conditions and all kinds of things, um, or plenty of other illnesses, you tend to blame yourself. Yes, or, you or don't want blame, that. Right, blame your physical body, right? Like, I wish my body would stop doing this to me. I just want to live a normal life. And in the end, you know, the blame is so hurtful. And so when you can understand scientifically where these diseases come from and how it's not hopeless that you can change your stress response and potentially reverse illness or even just calm it down uh, to make it something that's a lot easier to manage and bonus also feel happier and have less suffering about the things that you've uh, experienced is just so empowering. And I talk about Wellbe's mission being to empower people all the time. You know, it's a, being a patient advocate, I teach anybody I work with privately that, or I say, by the time we're done working together, my goal is that you are your own advocate completely. And you never feel the need to have an advocate because not only are you equipped with so much knowledge, but you have the, you know, emotional tools to uh, advocate for yourself. So this was all really helpful all along that mission statement. So, uh, Please, anybody listening to this that wants to go further, especially on the the adolescent girl topic, um, check out uh, Donna's book, Girls on the Brink, or just her work. I believe your website is just Donna. My Jackson Nakazala. Well, thank you very much again and um, have a wonderful day. Pleasure. Thanks for inviting me.